In November 1922, a boy walked through the desert mountains of Egypt and discovered some ancient steps carved into the rock. Subsequently, this find became one of the world's largest and most significant archaeological discoveries. This step was part of Tutankhamun's untouched tomb. Archaeologists found about 5,000 ancient objects, including jewelry, fabrics, painted vases, and funeral masks. You've probably seen one of them. It has become one of the most recognizable attributes of ancient Egypt. More than a hundred years have passed since then, and now humanity has finally become close to another large-scale discovery, the tomb of Cleopatra. This queen was the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, who sat on the throne from 51 to 30 BCE. There are many ancient records about Cleopatra, her reign, and her unusual personality. But until now, no one has discovered the secrets about her passing away in the burial place. So, one archaeologist, Dr. Kathleen Martinez, has been studying ancient records and temples around Alexandria for decades, and concluded that the tomb of the queen should be located under the ancient city of Taposiris Magna, founded in 280 BCE. It was a big city on the northern coast of Egypt, where tens of thousands of people were engaged in trade and industry. And it seems that Dr. Martinez's guesses turned out to be correct. She and a group of archaeologists have discovered a secret underground tunnel near Alexandria, with a length of about 0.8 miles. It was cut into the rock under Taposiris Magna's temple. During further excavations, they found many things that indicate Cleopatra's tomb lies in the tunnel's depths. It's also possible that she is buried there together with the Roman commander, Mark Antony. According to ancient records, Cleopatra and Mark Antony loved each other and together opposed the Roman Senate, which declared Antony a traitor. The fact that natural disasters have occurred on the territory of Taposiris Magna for thousands of years can complicate the excavations. Earthquakes and floods destroyed the city and possibly flooded its underground tunnels. But archaeologists hope the ancient tomb remains untouched and that it hides many treasures and records about the royal life of ancient Egypt during the reign of the last dynasty. There's a chance that excavations will go underwater and in the mud. This will require much time and funding, but archaeologists are sure it's worth it. Anyway, it's too early to say that Cleopatra is really buried there, but scientists have found many things in the tunnel that confirm this, including clay pots, dozens of coins with the image of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, as well as a bust with the image of the Egyptian queen. Cleopatra is still one of the most popular personalities in Egypt, on an equal footing with Rameses III and Tutankhamun. She inspired many films, paintings, and books, but what made her so popular? She became famous for her inconsistency. She was a beautiful, intelligent ruler who pulled Egypt out of the crisis and made it a prosperous power. Medieval Arabic texts say she knew chemistry, mathematics, and philosophy, and may have written several scientific books. She knew several languages and had excellent diplomatic skills. At the same time, there are many legends that she was a femme fatale who drove many men crazy. However, there's no evidence that her beauty was incomparable. The image of a stunning model was created by Hollywood when it made several films where famous actresses performed the role of Cleopatra. And the Roman Emperor Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, specially created the image of Cleopatra as an insidious seductress because he was her enemy. Even though she was born in Egypt, Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian. Her ancestors were Greeks, among whom was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. However, the people of Egypt loved her. She learned the language and was very sensitive to the traditions of this country. She knew the history, mentality, and customs of ancient Egypt well. She raised the level of its economy and strengthened its status as a world power. Much of this was made possible thanks to her cunning and impressiveness. She loved theatrical performances and lavish celebrations. She knew how to surprise people and put on a show. But behind the exterior image of a luxury lover was an intelligent and calculating ruler. Ancient Egypt was a rich, luxurious country, and Cleopatra did everything to increase its wealth and strengthen its position in the international arena. 
For example, she was once in conflict with her brother, Ptolemy XIII Odd. The queen knew that she wouldn't be able to resist him, so she decided to attract Julius Caesar to their side. The Roman emperor arrived in Alexandria, where Cleopatra wanted to meet him. But Ptolemy knew about her plans and was about to prevent her from coming to Caesar. Then, instead of a rich and noisy arrival, Cleopatra decided to make her visit inconspicuous. She wrapped herself in a carpet or linen bag the emperor's servants carried into Caesar's private chambers. Cleopatra emerged from the carpet and impressed the Roman emperor with her beauty and determination. As a result, they fell in love with each other and became close allies. After some time, she impressed another influential Roman for diplomatic purposes. She arrived to meet Mark Antony on a golden barge with purple sails and silver oars. Cleopatra was dressed in the image of Aphrodite and sat under a magnificent canopy. Her servants dressed like cupids and were blowing her fan and burning incense. But Cleopatra created such a show for a reason. She knew that Antony revered Greek mythology and considered himself the embodiment of Dionysus. As a result, he was so impressed with this woman that he ended up marrying her. Cleopatra defended her crown, strengthened her alliance with Rome, and bore Antony three children. In Egypt, they threw big parties and enjoyed wealth with power. However, the relationship of a high-ranking official with the Egyptian queen caused a scandal in Rome. Octavian was Antony's primary opponent in the struggle for power, so he exploited the situation to darken the competitor's reputation. He used propaganda to make Cleopatra an insidious seductress in the eyes of Roman citizens. He accused Antony of succumbing to her charms. The Roman Senate supported Octavian and declared Cleopatra an enemy. In 33 BCE, this conflict reached a high point when Antony's navy clashed with Octavian's fleet. The latter won and forced his enemy to flee to Egypt with Cleopatra. According to some records, they took refuge near Alexandria. Pursued by the Romans, they hid in one of Cleopatra's palaces and met their end. Some legends say that Cleopatra was an expert in poisons. She provoked a venomous snake, a viper or an Egyptian cobra, to bite her. Also, according to another legend, she pricked herself with a poisonous needle. There's a theory that Cleopatra always carried an ampule with poison inside her hairbrush. And when she was cornered, she soaked the needle with this poison and pricked herself. None of this can be said for sure. Scientists are still trying to find out the truth. Perhaps when they reach Cleopatra's tomb, the world will get more answers about her tragic fate. She is considered the last ruler of Egypt. After her passing, Octavian plundered her palaces and temples and returned to Rome, where he became the main emperor. He successfully ruled the country and expanded its borders. His reign ended when he turned 75. World history would have looked different if Cleopatra and Mark Antony hadn't lost that naval battle. By the way, did you know that more time has passed between Cleopatra's reign and Neil Armstrong's flight to the moon than between the reign of the Egyptian queen and the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza? Armstrong took a step on the Earth's satellite in 1969, 2038 years after the birth of Cleopatra. And the construction of the pyramid took place in 2560 BCE. Imagine how long the history of ancient Egypt is. Cleopatra is closer to us in time than to the pyramids. Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years. And it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Mobile Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there, even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave, and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, so not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say, thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. 
In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species, and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, and it makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now, I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. This is the Giant Crystal Cave, aka the Cave of the Crystals, in Mexico. These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white-tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the southern Atlantic Ocean. A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water, and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build a circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. 
The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. But then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous, unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now. Who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. And it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Russo was too dedicated to give up. And in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. But thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost 4 miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet. Legend has it that in the 17th century, Sir Isaac Newton noticed an apple fall from a tree and began wondering why the fruit had fallen to the ground and not upward or sideways. Well, that would be freaky. After years of studying, he concluded that gravity must be the culprit. The scientists called it a force of attraction that existed between all objects. But it was Albert Einstein, many years later, that revolutionized these ideas about gravity. Legend also has it that he wasn't completely satisfied with Newton's findings. Something just didn't seem right. As a young scientist, Einstein had some trouble formulating his theories trying to explain the behavior of moving objects. When an experiment came to his mind, he called it the happiest of thoughts. Gravity feels like the sensation of riding in an ascending elevator. He called it general relativity. Einstein began working tirelessly, trying to prove this idea. At one point, he even complained he was on the brink of losing his mind. Now, in the simplest terms, general relativity claims that gravity is the curvature or warping of space. The greater mass an object has, the more it warps the space around it. Imagine a heavy ball resting on a trampoline. The rubber sheet under it gets warped under its weight. It's the same with our sun. It's big enough to twist space across the entire solar system. That's why our planet, as well as all the others, orbit around the star. This warping also impacts how we measure time. If you look at your watch, time seems to go by at the same rate every day. But if you hike to the top of a mountain and your friend wanders through a valley at the bottom of this mountain, you'll see that your watches will calculate time differently. One watch will tick faster, while the hands of the second one, which is traveling through the valley, will move more slowly. That's because gravity affects how fast time goes by. With these experiments in mind, Einstein concluded that gravity was not a force of attraction, but rather a curvature in the fabric of space-time. We feel gravity as a force simply because we're placed on some surface. If there was no surface and no attraction between us and this surface, we would become weightless. If you don't mind getting some weird looks, try this experiment. You'll need a bathroom scale and an elevator to ride. You'll soon see that your weight fluctuates as you move up and down in the building in the elevator. The gravitational force is the same, but your weight is different because the elevator speeds up and slows down. Aboard the International Space Station, astronauts literally move along with the station, so there's nothing to push them against the side of the station so that they have some weight. Even if we still think of gravity as a force, it's the weakest one we know. First of all, it only attracts. There's no negative counterpart that could push things away. And weirdly, even though this force is strong enough to keep galaxies together, we still overcome it every day. 
every time you lift an object off the floor, you overcome the force of gravity produced by the entire Earth. Ooh! Just to paint a better picture, Earth's gravitational pull is weaker than the power of a refrigerator magnet. The fact that our planet has gravity also affects the way we look and act. All creatures on Earth are limited in growth by the height of their skeleton and by how much weight it can carry, which is directly proportional to gravity. That's why some marine creatures can grow bigger. The largest animal on our planet right now is the Antarctic blue whale. It's about the size of two school buses combined. That's because sea creatures can float, which slightly counteracts gravity. The effects of gravity can be seen in people, too. We are taller in the morning than we are in the evening. Our everyday activities and the added effect of gravity make the cartilage in our ankles, knees, hips, back, and neck compress. Once you have overnight rest, the cartilage swells back to normal. Gravity might also affect your shower routine. That is, if you're an astronaut. They have to rely on the old-fashioned way of bathing up there on the space station. They can't take a shower since the force of gravity up there is different and water doesn't flow as it should. Instead, they use liquid soap, water, and no-rinse shampoo. They first squeeze some liquid soap and water from pre-made water pouches onto their skin. Next, they open the no-rinse shampoo and add a little water to wash their hair. Towels are then used to wipe off the excess water, which is really precious in space. To make sure they recycle it, an airflow system quickly evaporates excess water. Gravity and weight shouldn't be confused. Astronauts on the space station do float, and you may sometimes hear that they are in the state of zero gravity. It's far from the truth, though, since gravity up there is about 90% of its value on our planet. But astronauts look and feel weightless, since weight is the force a certain object exerts on them back on Earth. Most creatures have evolved to sense and adapt to Earth's gravitational pull. In the sea, for instance, some fish have floating calcium carbonate deposits in their heads. Scientists call them ear stones, and they're pulled down by gravity. They act like a fish's internal compass. Now, plants have evolved to grow starch grains in the tips of their roots. They use this amazing feature to force their roots deep down into the soil. As little as we seem to understand it these days, we do need gravity for way more things than we can imagine. For instance, some bacteria become even more dangerous in space where there's little to no gravity. Salmonella, for example, the type of bacteria that is known to cause food poisoning, becomes three times nastier in the condition of microgravity. So you really gotta cook your chicken. Our own moon stays where it is because of the effects of gravity, too. If it weren't for this force, our satellite would have floated away by now. But it's held in place by Earth's gravitational pull. Objects with the biggest gravitational pulls in the universe are black holes. Thankfully, our planet is really far away from any of them. Nothing can escape the gravitational pull of a black hole, not even light itself. Similarly, gravity is different on each planet. And because of that, things weigh differently depending on which planet they're on. Take Earth, for example. An object that weighs 100 pounds here would only be 38 pounds on Mercury. But if you're planning on losing weight fast, try booking a trip to Pluto. Someone who weighs 150 pounds on Earth would weigh no more than 10 pounds on Pluto. The same person would weigh considerably more on Jupiter, which is the planet with the most powerful gravity. 150 pounds on Earth would turn into more than 354 pounds there. Mm, no thanks. Remember that experiment with watches ticking at different levels of elevation? It turns out that gravity isn't spread evenly on the surface of Earth. Why? Because our planet isn't a perfect sphere. The mass of Earth isn't evenly distributed either. That's why you get variations in gravity in different locations. More so, gravity is weaker at the equator because of the centrifugal forces produced by the planet's rotation. Since we've always perceived gravity as a force, we seem to believe that it has somewhat of a suction motion. But it's not exactly true. Back in 1998, scientists were baffled to see that the expansion of the universe was speeding up. So they linked this to the repulsive gravity of mysterious dark energy. We now know that dark energy makes up for more than 60% of the mass energy of our whole universe. 
But since nobody knows what it actually is, we can only make assumptions. And one that's largely accepted is quantum theory, which seems to claim that gravity pushes rather than pulls things in. You got all that? I may need to watch this one again. Have you ever wondered why mountains seem so still and silent? Well, prepare to be amazed because these majestic landforms have some hidden talents. You see, mountains are actually quite the performers. They have their own unique songs and dance routines. What does it mean and how does it work? Well, let's see. Get ready for a chilling revelation. Mount Everest has a secret nighttime symphony. And this mysterious music will send shivers down your spine. When darkness falls over the Himalayas, a strange eerie chorus echoes through the glaciers surrounding the majestic peak. A team of researchers embarked on a quest to unravel the mystery. Led by the glaciologist Evgeny Podolsky, they trekked through the freezing temperatures of the Nepalese Himalayas. Their goal? To uncover the source of these hair-raising noises. The team was amazed by the incredible size and beauty of Mount Everest. During the day, the weather was nice and they could work comfortably. However, when night came, it became extremely cold, reaching temperatures as low as minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit. At that moment, something interesting happened. The ice on the mountain started to break apart and make loud booming sounds that echoed through the valley. To solve the mystery, the team used advanced technology that is typically used to measure earthquakes. They placed sensors on the surface of the glacier and listened to the vibrations it created. They also looked at information about temperature and wind. By comparing all of this data, they made a very important and exciting discovery. The culprit behind this frozen orchestra? It's the sudden decrease in temperature. The icy surface of the glacier is very sensitive to these changes, causing it to crack and split with loud booming noises. This discovery helps scientists understand how glaciers behave in a world where climate change is becoming more pronounced. This adventure is really important because it gives scientists who study glaciers and the climate in faraway places like the Himalayas very valuable information. The melting of glaciers in that area is happening really fast. And that's a big problem. It's a serious threat to South Asia. A recent research shows that the glaciers have been melting 10 times faster in the past 40 years compared to the previous 700 years. But this isn't the only reason why mountains can make strange noises. Other mountains might also sing their own songs. For example, Mount Matterhorn. Guess what? Everything around us has its own special rhythm. Objects vibrate at certain frequencies because of their shape and what they're made of. You've probably seen it before with tuning forks and wine glasses. When they're hit with the right frequency, they start shaking and making sounds. But here's something cool. Even mountains have their own groove. They vibrate in their own unique way. Jeffrey Moore and his team of adventurous scientists wanted to find out if mountains can dance to their own music, just like bridges and tall buildings. They thought that the special shapes of mountains might make them vibrate at certain frequencies, which is called resonance. But testing this idea wasn't easy. Unlike buildings that engineers can shake or bridges that vehicles can drive over, mountains are massive and hard. It's hard to make them move on purpose. Not giving up, Moore and his team took on a big project. They wanted to study how the shaking of the earth affected the famous Matterhorn Mountain. This incredible mountain is located on the border of Italy and Switzerland. It looks like a pyramid. It's really tall, reaching about 15,000 feet high. It has four sides facing north, south, east, and west. With the help of helicopters, the scientists put special devices called seismometers in specific places on the mountain. One was placed at the very top and used solar power to work. It was as small as a coffee cup. Another seismometer was tucked beneath the floorboards of a cozy hut on the mountain, and a third one was placed at the base of the mountain to compare the measurements. Together, they were the tiny observers that kept recording the movements of the mountain all the time. And they finally detected it. Even though the mountain's movements are incredibly small, scientists discovered that the Matterhorn gently sways back and forth about once every two seconds. 
What's truly surprising is that the top of the mountain moves up to 14 times more than its base. The Eiffel Tower kind of does the same thing. This giant iron structure is a pro at handling windy days, and when a storm blows through, it's not afraid to show off its swaying skills. It's like the tower is saying, hey wind, bring it on. But the reason behind the mountain's movement isn't just wind, as it may seem. So why do mountains do that? Why do they dance and make a humming sound? Are they having a party that we're not invited to? Well, it's all because of something called seismic energy. When earthquakes happen in different parts of the world, their energy travels through the earth and causes the mountains to vibrate. The oceans also join in this mountain music. When waves move across the ocean floor, they create vibrations called micro -seisms. It's like the Earth's own heartbeat, felt all around the world. And guess what? The frequency of these vibrations matches the way the Matterhorn sways. It's like the mountain and the oceans are chilling together. So the next time you see a mountain, remember that it's not just standing still. It's actually part of a global symphony created by the Earth itself. This research helps us learn how earthquakes can affect steep mountains that are prone to landslides and avalanches. It also gives us a new way to appreciate mountains like the Matterhorn. They have their own hidden songs, swaying and vibrating to a mysterious melody deep within the earth. But there's one more pretty cool thing about the mountains. They don't just talk themselves. They may also influence the way we talk. Turns out, Languages spoken in high-altitude areas have special sounds that you won't hear elsewhere. After studying 567 languages, linguists found that 92 of them use a special kind of sound called ejectives. These sounds are made by pushing air out forcefully from the back of the throat. This creates bursts of speech that give these languages their distinctiveness. Scientists were really surprised by this connection. These sounds, like a strong K and K, are not common in English or European languages. But some indigenous languages in North America and the area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea have them. What's even more puzzling is that Tibetan languages, spoken in mountains, don't use adjectives. Linguists are curious to unravel this mystery and learn more about how mountains and language are connected. So why do some languages spoken in the mountains have special sounds? Well, it's a bit of a mystery. Researchers have some cool ideas. One idea is that these sounds might help people keep their throats from getting dry when they talk in the dry air of the mountains. Another idea is that the lower air pressure up there makes it easier to make these sounds. But scientists are still figuring out the real reason. Although some experts are not entirely convinced by this explanation. They say that while geography can influence language, there are other reasons why languages might be similar. Like borrowing words from nearby languages, or being close to each other. But this research has still given us some amazing insights. Mountains not only shape the way our world looks, but they also shape the way we talk. So, the next time you're exploring a mountainous area, listen carefully to the local language. You might hear unique sounds and words that are influenced by the mountains themselves. It's like nature is sharing its own special secrets through the language of the people who live there. And remember that the mountains themselves also have a voice, and they're speaking to us in their own special way. Scientists are still on an exciting adventure to uncover their secrets. So let's see what are some cool things they'll find out in the future. Stay tuned. It was 29,002 feet in 1954. 22 years later, it grew by 27 feet. In 1999, the top was 7 feet higher. In 2020, it was 3 feet less than that. What gives? Mount Everest is still the tallest mountain in the world, even though its height is constantly changing. It had been measured for the first time long before anyone even climbed it. In the 19th century, there used to be this thing called a theodolite, the grandfather of mechanisms engineers and land surveyors use today. It measured the angles between two horizontal points. After that, it would go with basic trigonometry to measure where the third point is and how distant it is. That's how mountains are measured. It was complicated because people who measured it had to know where sea level is. Now, there's no sea near the Himalayas, which is why surveyors had to walk all the way from the Bay of Bengal to do the measuring. Others who tried to measure Everest later got similar results, but never the same. 
Sea level is constantly going up or down because of changes happening on Earth, so it's not easy to be that precise. Mount Everest is part of the Himalayan mountains, and the whole chain is getting taller by around one-fifth of an inch a year. The tectonic collision that created the Himalayas in the first place started 50 million years ago, and it's still going on. That causes growth, but also brings earthquakes that are in charge of reducing its height. So the information from older geography books may not be accurate these days. Mount Everest is the tallest mountain, but only compared to those measured above sea level. There's Mauna Kea volcano in Hawaii, and if you measure from its underwater base, it's 4,000 feet taller than Everest. Antarctica actually has several time zones, nine of them to be precise. The Great Wall of China. Nope, it can't be seen from space. Sure, sometimes you can identify it when in lower Earth orbit, but at these heights, you can see many structures built by civilization. For example, the Great Pyramids of Giza. When on the moon, you can see some green vegetation and a beautiful, mostly white sphere, lots of blue, and patches of yellow. Nope. Oh no, you swallowed a gum accidentally. <laughs> no worries, your body won't need 7 years to digest it. It's a myth our parents told us to stop us from swallowing gums. Your body can't digest the ingredients found in gums, so it'll simply move it along. You don't swallow 8 spiders a year while sleeping. Spiders, luckily, don't care about humans, and they don't have any prey or something else that might interest them in your bed. They see you as some kind of a big rock. The air coming from your mouth is creating vibrations that will stop them from trying to get into your mouth. A popular story that famous physicist Albert Einstein failed math in school isn't exactly true. He failed in botany, zoology, and language sections at an entrance exam to a school in Zurich. He was always great at math. Boy, I sure wasn't. It never added up for me. Humans and dinosaurs never really coexisted. They missed each other by over 60 million years. Oil won't prevent pasta from sticking. If you like adding oil, feel free to, but it will only make pasta greasier. Stir it to stop it from clumping. You only use 10% of your brain, or not. You never use 100% of your brain all at once, but you use every region almost every day. Your brain needs to work at full capacity all the time because that's something that keeps you alive. Bananas don't grow on trees. They are big herbs that resemble trees. Pineapples grow from the center of a leafy plant that's on the ground. Goldfish may not be the smartest animal ever, but their memory is longer than 3 seconds. It's up to 3 months, which isn't a lot, but enough for it to remember your 3 wishes. Shaving won't thicken your hair. It'll grow the same as it was. You may only think it's darker or coarser because the hair will grow back with a blunt tip. Coffee lovers, don't worry, caffeine won't dehydrate you. It does have a diuretic effect, but still, the amount of water in your coffee has the opposite effect. So, you're good. You won't damage your eyes if you're too close to the TV screen. That blue light coming from it causes strain in your eyes, but it's a temporary condition. Dogs see more than black and white. They can't see the full color spectrum as humans do, but the world is not a couple of shades of gray for them. They have around 20 to 40% of visual acuity humans have, so distant things may be pretty blurry for pups. But they see better in dimmer light and can detect motions or any kind of movements way better than you do, especially when the delivery guy is approaching the front door. Bees aren't only attracted to yellow out of all shades, they also see colors a little bit different than humans. They recognize only lighter ones, such as green or yellow. All darker colors look black to them. That's why they're more likely to go for flowers with light colors and clothes of the same tones. If you're wearing a green t-shirt, you might look like a flower to them. Almost all creatures on Earth have a limited lifespan. One species of jellyfish is immortal. It matures, but at one point it simply reverts back to the juvenile polyp stage. That cycle of phases is endless. There are many types of berries, but a strawberry is not one of them. Scientists define berry as a plant with three distinct layers. There's an outer skin, a fleshy middle, and internal seeds. That means watermelon, grapes, and eggplants are technically berries. Polar bears aren't really white. They have black skin, and their fur is clear and hollow. They only look white because light hits their fur and stays trapped inside of that hollow part of a particular hair. That causes something called luminescence. With all that, 
salt particles stick to their fur and then start scattering light. If you set a chameleon on a yellow surface, it'll turn yellow. If you set it on a red one, it'll turn red. In fact, chameleons don't change their own color to adjust to the color of their surrounding. Their mood, the amount of light, and temperature makes them change color. So when you see a bright yellow chameleon, it might be angry. Giraffes have the same number of neck vertebrae as you do. An average human neck is only 4 inches long, while giraffes usually have a 6-foot neck. But both have 7 bones in their necks. Pirates don't have eye patches to cover an eye that's missing, but to increase their night vision. They had to be aware of everything going on around them. So... Many think it's just a dry desert with nothing but sand over there. But research shows there's definitely water on Mars. Scientists found big saltwater lakes under the ice at the planet's south pole. Bats are not blind. Their eyes are small and they don't see that well during the daytime, especially not so sharp and colorful as humans do. But their vision is adapted to different conditions and is excellent during the nighttime, unlike ours. Black holes aren't invisible. A black hole is a very compact and huge object that has an extremely powerful gravitational pull, so strong even light can't avoid it. The swallowing center is something scientists call the event horizon. It's surrounded by a glowing circle made of rock, debris, and space dust, so it can be seen pretty well. Scientists even got the first pictures of it. Despite what the name says, Iceland is not really covered with ice. The coast is ice-free during the entire winter. There are glaciers, but also lots of geysers and active volcanoes. In 2010, one of them woke up and threw up so much ash into the sky, air transport across Europe had to be stopped for a couple of days. Green peas, lentils, peanuts. Wait, peanuts? Yup, that's right. They don't belong to the group of nuts, but legumes. Moon has a dark side. Not quite. The side that's facing away from the Earth is no darker than any other part of its surface. Sunlight equally falls on all of its sides, so it only seems to be dark from our perspective. The Himalayas have some of the highest peaks in the world, including Mount Everest. But it's no surprise airplanes find it difficult to navigate the area. But why are commercial airplanes actually banned from flying there? For starters, these mountains have an average height of more than 20,000 feet. Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the entire world, stands at 29,037 feet high above sea level. The area is rough, filled with snow, and has almost no flat surfaces. In case of sudden cabin depressurization, it would be really difficult to perform an emergency landing since there's literally no flat area there. More so, the low oxygen environment at such an altitude means there's likely to be a lot of turbulence. Not only is it really unpleasant for passengers, but random air movements and high wind velocity means that it's really difficult to maneuver the airplane. This area is also quite low populated, so there's not much there in terms of radar systems. And radar is crucial for aviation safety. Without radars, pilots would be unable to communicate with the ground to figure out flight conditions. It can also get so cold up there that jet fuel might completely freeze. Sure, the fuels used in airplanes usually freeze at around negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but it may be possible above Everest. The lowest temperature was recorded there back in December 2004, when thermometers showed a staggering minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So, no wonder pilots don't want to ever take that risk, especially on a commercial flight. Among the few airports located in the Himalayas, there's one considered to be the most challenging to land in the world. Only eight pilots on the planet are certified to do it. It's called Paro International Airport, and it's located in Bhutan, a landlocked country in the eastern Himalayas. First, landing there is so dangerous because you're literally flying through some of the world's tallest mountain peaks. Not to mention that those eight pilots also have to consider strong winds. Despite the challenges, they do manage to safely land over 30,000 people each year. Moving further, there's no radar there to guide the pilots, so they need to maneuver the aircraft entirely in manual mode. The pilots need to track their movements based on specific visual landmark checkpoints as they approach the runway. Moreover, flights are only allowed there during daylight hours and under good visibility. These pilots also need to watch out for utility poles and roofs on the hillsides too. 
It means they often squeeze their planes between mountain peaks at 45 degree angles before dropping quickly onto the runway. No wonder only two airlines fly to Paro International Airport. Apart from these commercial pilots, there are specially trained helicopter rescue pilots who spend most of their career at 20,000 feet in the sky. Most of the time, they partner with equally experienced climbers who train by crossing the Kumbu Icefall. It's dubbed the most dangerous square mile on the planet. Made up of ice pillars as tall as a six-story building, this huge stretch of the glacier on Everest's western side is filled with bottomless ice holes. It takes between 4 to 12 hours to get from one edge of the icefall to the other, depending on the experience of the climber. You may think it's a pretty serene location since you're literally only surrounded by ice and snow, but these local professionals claim otherwise. One Everest veteran said that the noise was actually the worst part of the job. The mountain produces awful squeaking sounds and sometimes even sighs. It often makes people feel like it's talking to them, warning them about the treacherous environment. Mount Everest isn't the only no-fly zone in the world. Surprisingly, Disney parks are also part of this exclusive club. So you won't ever be able to look out of your plane window and see the beauty of fairy tale castles from up above. In recent years, a lot of crowded tourist attractions, including Disney parks, have increased their security measures to make sure their visitors are as safe as possible. As such, no aircraft is allowed to fly within 3,000 feet of Disneyland in California or Walt Disney World in Florida. It was initially a temporary ban, but this rule became permanent back in 2003. Some other places don't have planes flying over them because of their historical importance, like Machu Picchu, located in the Peruvian Andes Mountains. There's also a large number of rare wildlife species and plants that grow exclusively in this area. It's crucial that they're protected as well as possible. What does it have to do with planes not flying over that area? Firstly, it reduces the volume of harmful chemicals in the area. Secondly, if a plane ever needed to perform an emergency landing in this location, it'd cause irreversible damage to buildings and wildlife. Surprisingly, planes can fly over the Greek Parthenon in Athens, but with one condition, not to get closer than 5,000 feet above it. This way, the historical building is kept a bit more protected from any emergency landings, since there are specially designated areas around it. You won't be able to see the Taj Mahal from above either, since it's one of the most important, oldest, and most beautiful pieces of architecture in the world. It also needs added security features. This building dates back to the 1600s. UNESCO announced it a World Heritage Site in 1983. The Indian authorities set up a no-fly zone above it in 2006. They did it to safeguard not only the building itself, but also the crowds of tourists that come there each year. 7 to 8 million people. Buckingham Palace is well known for being the residence of British monarchs. So, for the Queen's security, a no-fly zone was set up here too. Planes aren't allowed to fly over Windsor Castle either to make sure the royal family is equally protected. Other important British buildings with no-fly zones include Number 10 Downing Street, the British Prime Minister's official residence and office, and the Houses of Parliament. George Washington's home in Mount Vernon, Virginia, can only have planes flying above it at more than 1,500 feet. The historical wooden mansion was built for President George Washington between 1758 and 1778. Unfortunately, the building has seen a lot of damage over the years. So, in an effort to preserve it better, authorities decided to prohibit vibrations produced by flying aircraft. That's why another no-fly zone was established there. It covers the airspace above this National Historic Landmark. That's probably the reason why you'll rarely see pictures of this house from above. Since it's the resident of the U.S. President, it's not allowed to fly over Washington, D.C. It's also the home of Congress and other establishments. So, the authorities set a special flight rules area, stretching for 30 miles around Ronald Reagan International Airport. This means that it's one of the airports with the most precise takeoffs and landings. Pilots have to carefully tackle no-fly zones, which sometimes results in uncomfortable takeoffs for passengers. Whenever a pilot breaks a no-fly zone, it's a big problem. 
like the one that happened back in 2005 when a pilot accidentally steered the plane into a prohibited zone. The capital had to be evacuated immediately, and their regular activities were interrupted. Other capitals of the world have similar requirements, like Budapest, for example. In the capital city of Hungary, planes aren't allowed to fly over the ancient inner city of Pest and the Buda Hills. Almost all air traffic is generally prohibited above Paris, too, with some exceptions. Aircrafts flying no lower than 6,500 feet. Flying helicopters are also a big no-no within the city limits. Only certain choppers undertaking precise missions can get special authorization. Generally, passenger planes aren't allowed near the island of Manhattan either, partly because of the really tall buildings there and the added risk of collision. But mostly because all three major New York airports, John F. Kennedy International Airport, Newark Liberty International Airport, and LaGuardia Airport are very close to each other. So the air traffic in the area has to be really well thought out to make sure the planes don't cross paths. At the beginning of the 20th century, somewhere off the coast of West Africa, a German steamship was leaving the port. Suddenly, the weather got worse and the vessel entered a thick fog. The sailors ran aground on a sandbank close to the shore. Luckily, no one was hurt, and they were even able to save their precious cargo. But the ship was stuck in the sand for good. And it was not alone there. Nearly the entire length of the western coast of Namibia is called Skeleton Coast. If the name sounds scary, that's because it is. This 976-mile-long beach line is among the most dangerous places on Earth. The local Bushmen tribes believe that their supreme deity made this land when it was angry. The Portuguese were the first Europeans to set foot in Namibia in the 15th century. And yep, they didn't like Skeleton Coast either. Portuguese explorers thought this land presented the gates to the underworld. This is the place where the Namib Desert meets the Atlantic Ocean. It might be dangerous, but it's actually beautiful. Plus, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. If Skeleton Coast had a PR manager, they would quit on the first day on the job. The area is not exactly tourist-friendly because of its geography and history. Beneath the sand and the waves, there is a secret ocean currently lurking for unsuspecting sailors. It's called Benguela Current. It flows towards the north along the coast of Southern Africa. This part of the Atlantic is rich in marine life, but the current's land neighbor isn't that happy with the deal. This arid climate created the Namib Desert, one of the driest regions on Earth. And that marine life I just mentioned? It's sharks. 11 species of them to be exact. And yes, the great white decides to pop by once in a while. So far, we've got a desert landscape, strong currents, and sharks. Not a place for a beachside resort, definitely. But if someone ends up on Skeleton Coast, will they know they're in danger? Don't worry, they will. The beach is littered with wrecks of all sizes and shapes. If you remember that German ship I mentioned in the very beginning, its massive and rusted stern is now sticking out from the desert sand. There are some 500 wrecks in total scattered along the coast, and it's a mixed crowd from Portuguese galleons centuries old to ships that ran ashore here in the 21st century. A modern fishing ship called Zela India managed to slip from its tow rope in 2008 and ended up on Skeleton Coast. Okay, it didn't escape on its own, it had some help from the elements. But it's better to be a tourist attraction on a beach than to be broken up for scrap. That's where the trawler was originally going, poor thing. Skeleton Coast's most famous inhabitant to call it such a place is the wreck of the Dunedin Star. The British cargo liner ran aground here in 1942. The massive rescue operation that followed reveals why it's so dangerous for sailors to end up here. The rescuers managed to save all of the crew and passengers, but at a heavy price. An aircraft and a tugboat were lost in the process. It took the last of the rescuers a full two months to return home to Cape Town. Why, you might wonder? One look at the map of the region reveals the reason. It's an endless sea of yellow, which is the sand. There are so few roads here, so Skeleton Coast is hard to reach by land. There are also legal obstacles. You need a special permit to drive into the area. 
But the skeletons in the name of the area don't only refer to ships, they also stand for animal bones. Most of these belong to whales and seals. Many animals have adapted to the area, so lions and hyenas roam the coastline in search of a meal. Yeah, now there are hungry lions as well, as if those sharks weren't enough. Other animals with a temporary residence on Skeleton Coast include elephants, cheetahs, leopards, and giraffes. In 1971, the Namibian authorities established a national park here. But except for surfers, after an adrenaline rush, they don't get many visitors. You can understand why. The Namib Desert is the oldest desert in the world, and it's not very tourist-friendly either. Those who travel to the region should pack sunscreen and a warm winter jacket. A weird combo, right? Well, not so much when you think that during the day, temperatures soar over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. At night, the air temperature drops below freezing. What a climate roller coaster! And that's not the final danger. Yep, there's more. Remember how that German ship got lost in thick fog? Yeah, it wasn't a one off event. Because of the region's climate, fog shows up frequently. Sailors should cover their ears now, but this fog is actually good for wildlife. This is their only source of water in the Namib Desert. Reptiles and mammals have adapted to the harsh climate. They use as little water as possible. Shifting sands, thick fog, strong currents, lions, and sharks. Not the stuff you would put in a tourist booklet, but Skeleton Coast isn't the only beach on Earth you wouldn't want to spend your vacation on. I will take you to Cape Tribulation in Australia. The area covers some 48 square miles in the northwestern part of the continent. And no, the area is not as dry as Skeleton Coast. It's part of the Daintree Rainforest. You could say that here, it is the rainforest, not the desert that meets the ocean. The beach at Cape Tribulation is straight from a postcard. But looks can be deceiving. Hmm, Australia? Probably sharks. No, crocodiles are out here to get you if you decide to go for a dip in the sea. There are saltwater crocodiles that the locals call salties. Well, that's a cute nickname for such a dangerous reptile. And it's not just them. The wildlife seems to have a beef with visitors. From October to June, the waters around Cape Tribulation are full of box jellyfish. Their venom affects the human cardiovascular system. When touched by a jellyfish out at sea, swimmers won't have enough time to reach land for help. Vinegar helps neutralize the sting, so you might want to keep a spare bottle in your luggage. Crocodiles and jellyfish sound dangerous, but there's one more animal you should look after. It's the wild boar. It might sound funny, but you won't laugh when you're being chased by one of these across the beach. 21 million wild boars live in Australia. They're mostly active at night, making it even more dangerous if they charge at you. The best defense is running in circles. Wild boars can't cut corners well. That's probably why we don't see many of them taking up careers as race drivers. Cape Tribulation has one last danger installed for you, and it's not an animal. Out here, even the trees are plotting against visitors. The stinging tree got its name for a reason. If you try to pick one of its beautiful red berries, it'll fight back. Its prickles are like tiny glass shards. The less than pleasant effect on your skin will last for a month. Then there is this wait a while bush. Who keeps naming them like this? This long vine has spikes that grab hold and just don't let go. They are so strong, they can pull a human off a horse. You'll have to wait for someone to come by and save you from this thorny grabber. If you are about to cross this Australian beach from the vacation list, hold on for a second. Tourism is booming here. The local authorities have restricted access to all of the danger zones. Visitors go swimming in dreamy water holes that are surrounded by lush vegetation. There are even ropes to swing from. Now, that's a beach you can finally relax. The year was 1854, and the SS Arctic, the fastest passenger liner of its time, set out to cross the Atlantic. As it sailed through the misty veil, it slowly disappeared into the unknown. The Collins Line, an American shipping company, was started in 1818 and only began seriously trading in the transatlantic by 1835. Its steamships crossed the Atlantic from Liverpool to New York 
within just 10 days. Doesn't sound like a great speed today, I know. But back then, the same thing took other ships several weeks. Light on the water with their wooden hulls, powering through with a strong steam engine. Those steamships were the favorite choice for many high-profile people. What could go wrong with such an advanced ship, they thought. This reminds me of some other ship everyone believed to be unsinkable. But anyway, back to the Collins Line. It grew to be a serious contender on transatlantic routes, with only one other competitor, the Cunard's Line. It was a British company also aiming to be the main force through the Arctic Passage. In 1835, the company received a new ship that traveled to Liverpool and came back to New York with the largest cargo ever at that time. From then, the Collins Line was steadily growing. It seemed like there would only be future successes for it. Unfortunately, their lavish ships became costly to run with the amount of coal used. Massive power along with weak wooden hulls meant they needed many repairs after each voyage. So, every trip ended up being expensive. But since the ships were safe and had a great reputation, people were willing to pay the price, and the company was definitely not in crisis. They had achieved something no one had managed to do before them. Like I told you, their ships crossed the Atlantic in a whopping 10 days. And Edward Collins, the owner, was very determined to maintain the pace. Their five ships easily outran the Cunard's line of only three. With this great praise, it provided more attention. Though the Cunard's ships were slower with their iron hulls, they believed there was still profit regardless of how slowly they sailed. Among Collins' ships, the Arctic, the third of them to be launched, was the largest, reaching 284 feet long with two side-lever steam engines, each with 1,000 horsepower. The paddle wheels made 16 revolutions a minute when at full speed. At the time of its launch, the press called it the most stupendous vessel ever constructed in the United States. But glamour and fame couldn't avoid what would come next. On the 27th of September, the Arctic was on its journey from Liverpool to New York, continuing a speed pace through the thick fog. It's possible that by that moment, after four years of record-breaking trips, the crew became overconfident with their sailing and the ship. Going only 50 miles from Newfoundland, they carelessly continued through the fog with no radio contact, sonar, or any other form of identifying objects, equipped only with Morse code. A smaller ship, the SS Vesta, which operated as a fishing vessel, often worked around Newfoundland. It was passing through the same path as the Arctic and crashed into its side. Shocked by the collision, the captain of the Arctic offered help to the much smaller Vesta, but it was soon clear that the damage that seemed minor on the Arctic was far worse. Beneath the waterline, a hole was letting water into the hull. The cost of the much faster wooden hull now seemed less valuable. They steered toward land, trying to plug the holes, but they weren't doing so well, and the seawater continued to pour in, filling up higher and pushing the ship down. And finally, once the engine room was full, it put out the boilers, taking away the massive power the Arctic was once legendary for. They moved slowly until coming to a complete stop. The ship continued to sink, and the order was to abandon it. At the time, maritime law allowed for the Arctic to carry only six lifeboats, only capable of saving 180 people. The crew and some of the passengers managed to push their way aboard and took most of the seats on those boats. Things were pretty wild, and everyone forgot about their manners, not letting the ladies and the youngest ones board first. It took four hours for the Arctic to sink. 150 crew and 250 passengers were on board. Those that weren't able to find a lifeboat made a desperate attempt to build their own rafts from parts of the ship. Two days later, only three boats made it safely to the shore. The other three were never found. Believe it or not, the rescue party also saved some people that had been clinging to the wreckage for two days. Unlike the crew, the captain went down with the Arctic, but amazingly survived. 
he would be only one of 85 people that made it out of the 400 on board. When the news arrived two weeks later, the public responded with great sadness to the losses. Great anger soon followed towards the poor safety measures in the crew. The press published demands to change the laws for more lifeboats. It only made sense to have enough for every person on board a ship. But they ignored those requests. This neglect would lead to more disasters in the future. Enough lifeboats would only come into maritime law some 60 years later, after the disaster of the Titanic. Edward Collins' wife and two children were also aboard the ship and didn't return. He was heartbroken, but didn't stop running his business. The Collins line still had a reputation to uphold, the biggest, fastest, and most luxurious on the Atlantic. Edward Collins would now build an even better ship than any other. It was named the Adriatic, and it was the largest ship in the world, 354 feet long. With two alternating steam engines that had never been built of this size, these steam engines at the time were at the height of engineering, though today you can only see them in models and toys. With the new addition of two masts, the Adriatic would also be able to sail if needed. Luckily, they made some lessons from the disaster of the Arctic. But before their new ship, the Adriatic, was built, another disaster had occurred. The sister ship of the Arctic had also sunk. They believed this second ship was desperate to stay in front of the Cunard's line and hit an iceberg somewhere during the race. This weird contest took the lives of 141 people. The desperation of Collins and his weakly built hulls pushed the company towards bankruptcy in 1858. The newly built Adriatic, costing over $1 million, had only made one voyage in the end. And even that voyage was considered a disaster. The ship collided with a tugboat. It still managed to finish its maiden voyage at a suitable time. After the company had gone bankrupt, they had to sell the ship for only $50,000. They removed the great giant engines, replacing them with only sails. Although it was once the greatest ship on the high seas, it was only 30 years later until it was abandoned, labeled irreparable and anchored in a river. The other remaining ships were also sold and only used for parts. Edward Collins left the industry altogether, seeking work on dry land instead. As the Collins line was no longer in the mix, the Cunards would grow in strength. Without competition, they would win the Blue Ribbon for the next 30 years, and 180 years later, after producing hundreds of ships. They still have a constant presence on the seas as they provide transatlantic crossings, world voyages, and leisure cruises. To this day, the Cunard Line is the only one to run ships between Europe and America, and it's great proof that it's not always the fastest that's the best. More than 25 million people boarded cruise ships globally back in 2017. It may not seem like a lot, but that's more than the total population of Belgium. It's a great vacation alternative with an added bonus. You can sample various different destinations for future time off in one single trip. If you've already booked a trip on a cruise ship, but you still have no idea what you should pack, start with some research on your specific cruise location. Either way, be sure to bring deck-friendly shoes that are low-heeled. Also, add a pair that's comfortable to walk on larger distances for the days spent ashore. Depending on the season, you might want to add a few swimsuits too. If you're on any type of medication, make sure you bring it with you in its original packaging. If you're a light packer, don't worry. Most cruise ships come equipped with laundry rooms. They're kind of pricey, especially if you want your garments to be washed, ironed, and folded for you. But it does save you the extra hassle of packing more clothes or washing them for yourself. It's really important that you check in with your credit card company before boarding a ship, more so if your itinerary includes one or more foreign countries. Your credit card might get frozen if there's any unusual activity on your account. Most of these companies have algorithms that get triggered once there are charges from different countries in rapid succession. 
which is exactly what you'll be doing on a cruise ship. Letting them know beforehand saves you the embarrassment of having your car declined at some fancy restaurant. To make sure you get the best room, before booking it, check out the ship's deck plan. It should be available on their website. If it's peace and tranquility you're looking for, don't go for the rooms directly above or below any of the ship's entertainment points. Also, if you have a history of getting seasick, try to skip the rooms that are available at the front of the ship. Rather, go for those located in the middle of the ship on a lower deck. You'll feel less movement. If it's your first time going on a cruise, you might be surprised to know that some cabin rooms don't have windows. Before making a reservation, make sure to check out all the amenities of the room you intend to book. Most cruise liners add a bunch of pictures from the common rooms on their reservation pages, and it might be a bit confusing as to what you're getting exactly for that specific price point. Also, some rooms on board are quite small too. If you don't like to sleep in small spaces, you might want to upgrade to a larger room, even if it's a bit pricier. You can always split the cost with a friend if they want to join you on the cruise. With the help of modern technology, even if a specific location doesn't have windows, it doesn't mean you can't watch the waves. How, you might ask? Fancier cruise ships feature a secret added bonus. In the areas with no access to sunlight, specialists have built virtual balconies. These high-tech screens work by showing you what's going on outside in real time. They have an added benefit too. In case of bad weather, guests can still have a feel of the outdoors without the wind or rain ruining their hair or their outfit. It may not be the real deal, but it still beats getting claustrophobic on board. Planning on going on a budget cruise? It might not be such a bad idea, especially if you're on the lookout for last minute upgrades. You might even end up vacationing like a millionaire without having to spend money like one. These upgrades sometimes include things like a private balcony in your room, maybe some spa services, or even better prices for high-end meals. If they aren't all booked by the time people board the ship, they might be open for the rest of the passengers for way better prices than initially listed. There might be hidden freebies on board if you pay close attention. Things like complimentary pastries on board late in the morning or a late night cup of tea on the house might be some of the things offered to guests. You only need to ask. You might want to check out what other tourists are doing. Some people with more experience cruising can offer pretty great tips and tricks. Don't be afraid to start a conversation if you see someone getting something for free. Some cruise ships do go all the way on the fancy dial. They even have exclusive areas designed for guests staying in expensive suites. Most of the time, they're located at the top of the ship. On one particular cruise, these types of guests have designated staff members called Royal Genies, which are similar to butlers. They can cater to just a few cabins. Since the cruise line wants to divert other guests from asking them various questions, which will take time away from their assigned guests, the genies do not wear a name tag in public areas. Most common areas of cruise ships do require travelers to follow a dress code, but if you do your research in advance, you might find that some areas are more relaxed when it comes to what people need to wear. Most cruise ships require people to adhere to smart attire, which means pants with a collared shirt for men, or blouses and skirts, dresses, or stylish pants for the ladies. As for the travel destinations, be sure to research the ports you're about to visit in advance. You'll know what to wear, what the weather will be, and if you need to pack anything else, like an umbrella or a beach towel. Stops on cruises only last for a few hours in most cases, so you'll want to get the most out of them. If that specific location includes museums or art galleries you want to add to your checklist, be sure to book in advance so you don't waste time waiting in lines. Some cruise ships even provide their guests with private tours of the ports they're about to visit. Do make sure to book them in advance if this is something you might be interested in as the list gets pretty full quite fast. Independent tours are a bit more private. You can spend time with your tour guide and even ask more questions. 
always remember to put your phone in airplane mode while on board. Most cruise ship horror stories involve cruising newbies that ended up paying thousands of dollars in cell phone charges while on ships just because they forgot to turn it off. If you're the type of person that can't switch off their phone, be sure to check with your cell phone provider before traveling internationally. Some can provide special plans for limited amounts of time without extra charges. You'll be free to chat, call, or browse YouTube videos without worrying you'll end up paying a fortune. Most cruise ships also provide you with complimentary Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi packages that can be purchased in advance, which are way more affordable. You can stick to communicating with your friends and family back home via FaceTime or Skype. People that have heard about the Titanic tragedy will always wonder what might happen if something goes wrong while on board. Let's take lifeboats, for instance. The Titanic had a mere 20 lifeboats on board, which were tragically not enough to fit all the passengers after the ship hit the iceberg. Some fancy cruise ships these days have an even lower number of lifeboats, anywhere from 15 to 18. Sounds strange? Well, not really, given the fact that each lifeboat can accommodate up to 370 people. Even the largest ships, which have an estimated capacity of 8,000 people if fully booked, including tourists and staff, are safe in case of an emergency. There's a heavy snowstorm. The cold penetrates his bones. His legs are almost knee-deep in snow. Experienced hunter Joe LaBelle makes his way through the forest, covering his face from the headwind. Any other person would have already fallen and screamed in despair, but not Joe LaBelle. He can survive in any circumstances and always knows what to do. Right now, he's heading to one of the villages in the far north of Canada. This small settlement is located on Lake Anjakuni. The inhabitants of this village are Inuit, indigenous people of North America. Joe hasn't eaten or drunk for a long time. He needs a good sleep and a hot meal, which he hopes to get from the hospitable Inuits. Through trees and a white haze, he notices the silhouettes of tents. Smoke is coming from some houses. Joe will probably get there in time for lunch. He reaches the village, and, at this moment, the wind calms down. The blizzard has ended. The hunter speeds up and goes toward the village, located along the frozen lake. It's strange, but there are no locals anywhere. Probably everyone is just sitting in their houses, waiting out the blizzard. Hello, Joe says loudly, but gets no response. Oh, great, smoke is coming out of this tent. Joe knocks on the wall, but no one opens it. He knocks a few more times and goes inside. The little tent is empty. All things are in their places. There's a piece of cloth with needles and thread on the table. Firewood is smoldering in the fireplace. It seems that people have just left this place. Joe goes into the next tent and sees the same picture. All things are in their places, but there are no people. Joe walks past the tents and sees a pit where a bonfire once burned. There's a rope above it, with the meat that the Inuit were cooking hanging on it. For some reason, they didn't eat it. Lake Anjakuni is part of a chain of waterways. Here, the Inuits fished and traded various goods. Usually, there are many people here, but now something has forced them to leave their homes. Why did they leave their things behind? And where did they go? There are no tracks around the village. All the sleds are in place. The Inuits have even left their dogs here. And dogs help them to hunt and ride sleighs. No one will leave warm clothes and dogs here when moving away, especially in severe weather. Joe LaBelle knows all this, so he concludes that something terrible has happened here. His body is shaking, not from the cold, but from fear. After going around the entire settlement, he finds not a single soul. Terrified, he leaves the village, heads for the nearest telegraph pole, and sends a message to the police. After a while, more and more people arrive. The police are trying to find traces of missing people and figure out what has happened. But there's nothing. 
Near the village, they find an empty grave. During the ceremony, the Inuits place stones around the burial site. The rocks around the open pit lie untouched, which means it wasn't an animal that dug it up. But who or what needed it? About 30 people lived in the village, and they're all gone. Local residents from neighboring villages can't help, since they have no idea what has happened. The only thing that the police have noticed is unusual blue lights. In this area, the northern lights are a common phenomenon. People living here regularly see a glow in the starry sky. But the police have seen something else, pulsing blue lights. Also, other hunters have witnessed something similar. They say that some strange things were flying in the sky. This all happened in 1930. It's been almost 90 years since the disappearance of the village, and people have created a bunch of theories. The most popular of them is an attack of an extraterrestrial civilization. According to this theory, the blue lights in the sky that the locals and the police saw were spaceships. Some believe that one ominous night, these ships flew to the settlement and took away all the people. In addition to these sci-fi versions, there were also more realistic ones. Internet users have found out that Joe LaBelle didn't have a hunting license. Maybe he wasn't a professional and made it all up. But at that time, many hunters didn't have a license, so Joe's words may be true. But if we try to find out where all this information came from, we'll see that the primary sources were books and some newspaper articles from the 30s. But none of them can confirm that the mysterious story of Lake Anjakuni is true. Perhaps this entire story was made up. Now let's leave the snows of Canada and head for the hot plains of India. In this big country, there's one sinister village where people also disappeared without a trace. This happened in the first half of the 19th century. Still, locals avoid this place even now because they believe that invisible evil forces live there. Let's check and find out what happened to the village of Kuldara. It's located in the district of Rajasthan. To get there, you can use a taxi to get to the nearest village or city. The village is located far from other settlements. It looks deserted. There are only ruins. It looks like archaeologists have recently dug this place out of the ground and left it here. But this is not an ancient city. The village was abandoned more than 200 years ago. But up to that point, this place had been thriving. Kuldara was a large village. Local people were mostly farmers. They sold their agricultural products. And then, one night, everything changed. People abandoned their homes and stuff and ran away from there. No one knows why they did it, and no one knows where they went. Nobody has ever seen the inhabitants of Kuldara again. Apart from tourists, almost no one comes here. The locals are sure that the village is cursed and is the center of paranormal activity. If you ask residents of other nearby towns, or read the information on the internet, you'll learn a couple of legends about this place. One popular version says that people left this village because of a lack of water. However, this version doesn't explain why the residents did it overnight and left their things behind. According to another version, the villagers ran away to save the daughter of the Kuldara chief. One local ruler fell in love with her and wanted to marry her. He threatened the locals with grave consequences if the girl rejected him. The ruler gave them one day to make a decision. The residents disagreed with such a requirement. As a sign of solidarity, they decided to leave the village together with the chief and his daughter. But if this is true, why did no one else see these people? They must have escaped to another settlement. In addition, they needed their things on the way there. The stories of Kuldara and Lake Anjakuni have one thing in common. People left a comfortable and safe place for an unknown reason. A similar story happened in Ireland with a small village on the island of Ackle. 
about 40 simple houses made of stone and straw were located along the valley of Keem Bay. The village was mentioned in documents dated back to the 1830s as a group of small buildings. But today, there's practically nothing left of it, except pieces of walls and small mounds of ground. People from other settlements don't remember this village, but we know about it thanks to the records of travel writers. They describe the incredible beauty of this place and the village in their diaries. Students of the local archaeological school tried to find the answers. They started excavations and discovered that the villagers could have left the village because of hunger or some disease. All right, so let's start our journey with one of the most famous and scary vanished villages. It's located in India, the district of Rajasthan. This is Kuldara village. Unlike other abandoned places, this one is difficult to get to because the locals won't want to take you there. People are afraid of this place and try to avoid it. You can't get a taxi and drop off near this spot. The driver will tell you where to go. You won't find any traces of civilization nearby. The village is located in a hot desert area. But when you get close to it, you'll feel an unpleasant chill down your back. You won't find any vegetation because of the heat. There were only ruins of buildings and sand-covered roads. It seems as if you're walking through the excavations of an ancient city. But Koldara is not so old. It only vanished in 1825. Before this time, the village had been thriving. It was almost a town consisting of many small settlements united into communities. Residents were busy with agriculture there. Plus, they went mining and extracted valuable gypsum rocks and minerals. But suddenly, everything changed overnight. For some unknown reason, people abandoned their homes and ran away. No one knows why, and no one has ever seen the residents again. Locals living in the nearest areas are sure that this place is cursed, so they never come close to it. They think this is the center of power from the other world. Some people feel sick here, others claim to see phantoms, and still others experience irrational fear. But tourists like to go there. The simplest and least scary vision says that people left the village because of the lack of water. Still, this version seems weird. If there had been a lack of water, people would have planned the change of location instead of running away in a hurry. The second version is way more mystical. There's a legend that one cruel ruler collected large taxes from this community. He fell in love with the daughter of the Kuldara chief and threatened that he would collect higher taxes if the girl refused to marry him. He gave her one day to make a decision. None of the residents agreed with such a requirement. As a sign of solidarity, they decided to leave the village. Those who don't believe in all these rumors can spend a night in a tent there. Chances are, you'll hear someone screaming or feel someone walking and knocking on your tent. Nah, just kidding. Our next village is in the US, in the state of Pennsylvania. More precisely, it's not even a village, but a borough called Centralia. This place looks totally lifeless. Burnt trees, dried grass, empty buildings. Almost all the roads here have huge cracks. People sprinkle them with gravel to decrease the amount of thick smoke that's pouring from the ground all the time. This abandoned place has been burning for more than 50 years. No wonder this place reminds of something. The authors of the horror game Silent Hill got inspiration from this town. Centralia was a mining town with shops, cafes, libraries, and happy residents. People worked in the mines to get anthracite coal. They used one of the underground tunnels as a landfill for garbage. And then, in 1962, according to the popular version, they decided to get rid of garbage by burning it. The plan failed. As soon as the garbage caught fire, it spread throughout the mine. Then, all mining work in the town stopped because of the increased level of carbon dioxide. Residents didn't manage to extinguish the fire, and it started to spread underground throughout the whole city. Roads began to heat up. The soil became poisonous. Thick smoke slowly filled the streets. People were evacuated from this place. By 1992, Centralia was completely abandoned. The town looks ominous, and some people believe it's not just because of the fire. They believe not all people managed to evacuate. 
and their phantoms are still walking through the burning streets, waiting for someone to finally put an end to this eternal fire. Just imagine a prosperous, beautiful village where people do agriculture on fertile land and bake delicious bread. And then, bang! Everything disappears! There were only traces on the ground and a couple of bricks left from beautiful stone houses, mills, and chapels. Huge fertile fields became abandoned, and no one knows why. Well, welcome to the English village of Gainsthorpe in Lincolnshire, or rather what's left of it. From above, you'll see earthen ramparts on the grassy field, the outlines of roads, sunken hollows, and barely distinguishable contours of the walls of houses and barns. If you come here, you may not even notice the traces of the village. It's just an unusual green field. But in the 17th century, life was thriving here. Let's try to solve this mystery. The first mention of this place dates back to 1086. I wasn't around then. Since that time, it was prospering. There were about 19 fertile fields, a chapel, a mill, a bridge, and a manor house where the lords lived. In total, there were about 25 buildings. From the records dating to the 16th century, you can find that quarries appeared in the village. That is, this place not only got wealthy, but also kept pace with progress. Then, by 1616, the village had become completely abandoned. Scientists are still looking for an answer to this question. Some believe that something terrible and mystical happened to the village. One of the main hypotheses explaining what happened is the plague. Another version is that Gainsthorpe still couldn't catch up with progress. In the 17th century, there was a transition from rural to urban life. Industrialization had begun. Many young people left their native villages to search for a better life. Some believe that groups of robbers and thieves settled in the village. They turned Gainsthorpe into their base and eventually plundered it all. The exact reason is still unknown. But the good news is that, theoretically, the village can be returned. Specialists can reconstruct the ruins and recreate agriculture. The hardest part, though, is to find funding. A similar fate befell the small village of Ackle Island in Ireland. About 40 simple houses made of clay and straw were located along the valley washed by Keem Bay. And it was just a fantastic place to live. Coast, mountains, crystal clear water, and rich soil. The village was founded in 1838. Now, there are several mounds of ground and small pieces of walls left of it. Locals living in neighboring settlements don't remember this village. Or maybe they know something, but don't want to say anything to anybody. Only travel writers described it in their diaries as a place of serene beauty. Now, many towns nearby still exist, but why did this one disappear? An inexplicable phenomenon that sweeps entire villages off the face of the Earth? An unknown, mystical, scary force? If there is nothing fantastic about this village's disappearance, then why don't people build any new houses here? Perhaps they're afraid of something. So, the local archaeological school students decided to find the answer to this question. They started excavating the village in search of clues. They found out that some kind of trouble happened to this place in the middle of the 19th century. But it's not known exactly what. At that time, a terrible period of famine came. Perhaps people simply left their homeland to find food elsewhere. Anyway, work on excavation continues, and the students intend to uncover the truth. In the 20th century, more and more villages became abandoned all over the world. The main reason is the relocation of residents. Young people don't want to live away from the modern world. But older adults can't leave their native place, so they stay there as the last residents. And then, several years later, when they have uh, bought the farm, so to speak, villages get abandoned. Another problem is access to medicine. In some places, people have to drive tens and hundreds of miles to the nearest doctor. But many villages are still thriving. Some towns receive more funding and have developed agricultural businesses. Besides, not everyone likes city life. Often, city administrations specifically distribute free land to people in rural areas so that they can build houses there. Imagine you decided to take a road trip the old-fashioned way. 
And by that, I mean you decide to do it without the help of any technology. What? So you go to the nearest convenience store and buy a map of each state you plan to pass through. You buckle them up on the passenger seat right next to you and set off on your adventure. During your first week, you arrive in the state of New York. You wave bye-bye to Lady Liberty, eat a slice of pizza, and head upstate. Near the Catskills, you notice you're running low on gas and decide to stop in the nearest town to fill up your tank. You check your map, and it appears that the nearest place is a small village called Aglo, right at the next intersection. You drive a few minutes and pass through a sign that says, Welcome to Aglo, home of the Aglo General Store. Well, this must be it, you think to yourself. But the town is strangely empty. You can't find the store or the gas station you were looking for. There are no houses. You start to think there might be a mistake. Aglo doesn't seem to exist. This story may sound made up, but it could have actually happened to anyone passing through New York a few years ago. Actually, the so-called town of Aglo is what is called a phantom settlement or a paper town. There are several of these around the world, but Aglo is probably the most famous. Paper towns are basically fake towns. That is, they don't really exist. They're made up of Easter eggs put there by map makers as a kind of copyright trap. Maps are tough to make. To create a map from scratch, one has to do years of field work or analysis of satellite photos. That's why plagiarism has always been rampant among map makers. It's pretty easy to redraw the same geographical features from one map onto a new map, and it is hard to get caught. People are, after all, drawing the exact same world. That's why map makers came up with a way to catch individuals stealing their data. Some map makers may include a mountain that is bigger than they are in reality. Others might add a slight turn on a road, where in reality there is none. For example, in the early 1970s, a fake mountain peak appeared on some Boulder County maps. The addition of this previously unknown peak, called Mount Richard, into local maps began to confuse Colorado rock climbers at the time. It turned out that Mount Richard was one of these copyright traps, put there by a local maps man called <laughs> Richard Siachi. Let's just say he must have decided to pay a tribute to himself with this little addition. Now, adding a paper town is perhaps one of the most extreme solutions, one that map makers hope goes unnoticed. But that's not what usually happens, which leads us back to the Aglo story. Map makers Ernest Alperts and Otto Lindbergh from the CDG, General Drafting Corporation, were part of the largest map publishers of the 1930s. Back then, the company was commissioned to create a map of the state of New York. That's when the two men had an idea. In order to prevent copyright infringement, they would create a phantom settlement combining parts of their names together. They came up with the strange name Aglo and added the fake town along Route 206 near the water reservoir of Catskills in upstate New York. The area was supposed to be, in reality, a dirt road. Years later, Rand McNally, another map designing company, produced a map of New York that included a town called Aglo in the same location where CDG had originally placed it. Lindbergh was convinced that he had a copyright case against his competitor, but the story just kept getting more complicated. Both companies went to settle the case in court. But as it turned out, McNally had a legitimate reason for adding Aglo to their version of a New York map. You see, in order to fabricate their maps, McNally did a thorough research on real estate and establishments located in each existing town. And as it turned out, Aglo was not an empty town when they drew their map. Records show that the town housed an establishment named Aglo General Store. Sure, it was the only building in town, but that was enough for the map makers to believe that such a town really existed. They added Aglo to the map like they would add any other town with physical establishments. It seemed they weren't infringing any copyright if this once phantom settlement had somehow come to life. The plot twist is that CDG's Alpers and Lindbergh could never have foreseen that someone would decide to occupy a made-up town. But it happened. One day, someone bought a map from a regional gas station that had Aglo marked on it. The person wanted to open a store more or less where Aglo existed, so they decided to name the store after the town it was in. They trusted the accuracy of the map they bought and named their business Aglo General Store.
After all, why would there be a non-existent town on an official map? The general store didn't last many years, only enough to turn this story into a mess. On the bright side, <laughs> this whole debacle turned Aglo into a super-famous fictitious settlement. It became a tourist spot, with people driving from all over the US to get a picture of the town's welcome sign. Now, as we said before, paper towns are plenty around the world and over time, too. A 2005 BBC documentary revealed that the city of London alone had over 100 tiny fake streets or paper streets around the city. For instance, the so-called Moat Lane is supposedly a curving road in Finchley, North London. But if you ever decide to go visit, you'll find nothing but trees and gardens. And what about Argleton? a town in the north of England, or, more accurately, an empty field in northeastern England. Argleton existed for a while on Google Maps. There were hotel listings and apartments for rent in town. Well, the only thing is that they weren't really in Argleton, but rather in nearby settlements. It's believed that Google Maps imported these fake streets into its database as they used renowned copyrighted atlases as their sources. But as the truth about these paper streets surfaced, the company later deleted them. If we turn back the clock a few hundred years, we'll find another mystery story involving a possible phantom settlement. But this isn't a tiny town at an intersection, but rather an entire island. Bermejo Island was speculated to be a tiny inhabited island. It appeared on many maps of the 16th and 17th centuries and was a hot spot for Spanish explorers. Its location sometimes varied slightly from map to map, and occasionally, its name appeared as Vermija, but its existence seemed certain enough. It wasn't until the 18th century that the island stopped being depicted in maps altogether. This island's last appearance dates back to a 1921 edition of a Mexican atlas, and then poof! It dropped out of the horizon altogether. The case of Mexico's disappeared island has raised many questions. Did it sink? Was it destroyed? Are people simply looking for it in the wrong place? Three official investigations took place in 2009 to locate the island. They used high-end technologies, scouring Mexico's oceans and seabeds. Yet, Bermija remained nowhere to be found. One can't help but wonder if the island ever existed at all. Similar to modern-day mapmakers, 16th and 17th century mapmakers had their way to trick map users. Instead of copyright traps, these fake towns or even fake islands served as a way to fool and confuse enemies and unwanted voyagers. Since a long time has gone by, it's hard to know whether Bermija was just another phantom settlement. It stopped being depicted on maps, but this mysterious case still leaves people baffled and confused. It was April 10, 1912. Richard had just departed from Southampton, England aboard the most famous ship of the time, dubbed the Unsinkable. Since he had just witnessed a near collision with the SS City of New York, he decided to write to his wife and report the unfortunate and frightening event. My dearest Sal, he wrote, we got away yesterday after a lot of trouble. Little did he know that a mere four days later, both his pen and the ship he was on would be lost forever at the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean. Was this some sort of bad omen? Did Richard actually foresee what was about to happen to the ship he was on? In case you haven't figured it out by now, Mr. Richard Geddes was aboard the Titanic on the day that he wrote the letter to his wife. On April 14, 1912, the ship seemed to have been lost forever. Along with it, so many secrets and treasures have settled at the bottom of the ocean. It took until 1985 for the Titanic's wreck to be finally rediscovered using state-of-the-art sonar technology. Ever since then, they've managed to recover thousands of items from the Titanic, and many of them went on display or auction. Things like jewelry, a life jacket, a menu from the ship's restaurant, or even a sample square of carpet from the first-class stateroom have all captivated the public's attention, just like the many stories of the people on board. Scientists have even tried to come up with strategies to get the Titanic back up altogether to properly study it and stop it from getting more and more damaged at the bottom of the ocean. Some have suggested filling the wreck with ping pong balls to make it float, while others even considered injecting it with 180,000 tons of Vaseline. Another idea 
was to use 450,000 tons of liquid nitrogen to trap it in an iceberg that would float to the surface. But they eventually had to let go of all these potential strategies, since the Titanic is way too fragile to ever be recovered. The Titanic may be one of the most interesting ships lying at the bottom of the ocean, at least in popular culture, but deep sea divers have a lot of other stories to share. Planes also sometimes find their way to the bottom of the ocean. Deep sea divers in Oahu, Hawaii came across the wreckage of an F-4U Corsair plane. It seems to have crashed into the ocean in 1946, as it didn't have sufficient fuel. If you can dive deep enough, you might even stumble upon statues and lost artifacts, like those found in the world's only underwater archaeological park off the coast of Naples, Italy. It features the ruins of the ancient Roman city of Baia. The underwater statues found here are breathtaking, to say the least. In an ironic twist of events, some of the equipment we intended to use to get us to the moon was lost at the bottom of the sea for a very long time. But how did that happen? Beginning from the late 1960s and ending in the early 70s, many Apollo rockets were launched to orbit the Earth and the Moon. When reaching altitudes of about 38 miles, the first portion of the spacecraft, including the engines, needed to separate. People thought these components got destroyed or lost forever. But were they really? In 2012, a team of specialists discovered a bunch of rocket engines 14,000 feet off the coast of Florida. They have since gone through a two-year renovation plan and are now on display at Seattle's Museum of Flight. Can you imagine stumbling upon a whole city underwater? Back in 2001, a lost city was discovered in the Gulf of Cambay, off the coast of India. Some archaeologists believe it to be the oldest city in history. By comparison, it's almost the size of Manhattan and features massive walls and even plazas. They stumbled upon pieces of sculpture artwork, and even what looked like ancient wooden furniture, believed to date back up to 9,500 years ago and 5,000 years older than any city previously discovered. Okay, how about an underwater river? I can't even imagine what that would look like, but some deep divers claim to have seen it south of Tulum, Mexico. Is that even possible? Well, not really, since the Cenote Angelita Cave is not a true river but a very special type of optical illusion. It's formed by a halocline, meaning a cloud of hydrogen sulfide at the bottom of this underwater cave. Turns out you can actually swim right through this cloud, which makes you feel like you're swimming through a flowing body of water. Not all things discovered underwater are inanimate objects. Some of them are actually quite scary sea creatures. A jellyfish might not be on your list of things to look out for if you can avoid the stings. But this giant one, also known as a lion's mane jellyfish, is the largest known species of its kind. In all fairness, you'll only uncover it if you happen to dive into the waters of the Arctic, Northern Atlantic, and Northern Pacific Oceans. You surely won't miss it, since it stretches across 120 feet from the top to the bottom of its tentacles. When it comes to deep sea diving, a lot of people are looking to discover some lost treasure. One diver was lucky enough to have hit the literal jackpot when he came upon nearly $1 million worth of treasure on the bottom of the seabed. That was back in 2015, when this lucky diver was swimming just off the coast of Florida. What did he find, you might ask? Well, about 51 gold coins, 40 feet of gold chain, and a rare single coin that was tailored for the King of Spain. Philip V. Speaking of people looking for lost treasures, divers also sometimes found pirate ships. They discovered one of these pirate shipwrecks in 2015 off the coast of Colombia. It dates back to the 18th century. The value of this forgotten ship was estimated to be between $4 billion and $17 billion, as it contained treasures, precious stones, gold, and countless other really valuable items. By comparison, a whole island in the Bahamas is up for grabs at $75 million. A computer is the last thing you'd ever expect to discover underwater, right? And this was no regular computer, but an ancient one. And yet, someone stumbled upon it between 1900 and 1901 on the spot of a shipwreck located off one Greek island. 
Researchers believe this weird stone contraption to be the earliest form of a computer. It was designed to serve many purposes, such as predicting astronomical positions and eclipses on the calendar. Since humanity lost most of the technology used back then, it was wonderful to rediscover it so many years later. It let us piece together many of the ancient Greeks' accomplishments. The computer is now at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens, should you ever want to check it out in person. This has to be one of the most mysterious places on Earth. It's called the Mariana Trench, and it's the deepest part of the Earth's oceans. We really don't know how deep it is, since it's so difficult to measure. But it's somewhere around 7 miles deep, and 5 times longer than the Grand Canyon. They first studied this massive underwater hole back in 1875, using a weighted rope. Back in 2012, a Canadian film director named James Cameron reached the bottom of the trench in the submersible vessel Deep Sea Challenger. Some of the most bizarre creatures on the planet call this place their home, including the Dumbo octopus, the sea cucumber, and the goblin shark. The Mariana Trench took its name after the nearby Mariana Islands, which are named Las Marianas in honor of the Spanish queen Mariana of Austria. Have you ever wondered how cool buildings of the future are going to look? Well, hold on tight because artificial intelligence is here to revolutionize the world of architecture. AI is a great sidekick. It can give the architects incredible new tools to create mind-blowing structures that are not only stunning, but also eco-friendly and super efficient. So let's check what our beautiful future might look like. First of all, you know how cities can get crazy busy and overwhelming, right? Well, guess what? AI is here to save the day and make our cities super smart. Imagine you're cruising down the road in your flying car. Yes, we'll have those. Thanks to AI, the traffic flows like a dream. No more endless gridlock. The city knows where the most likely crime spots are and takes proactive steps to keep us safe. It's like having superheroes on every corner. And hey, forget about trash piling up. AI makes sure waste is managed efficiently, keeping our city clean and fresh. They can act as a city manager who can optimize everything from traffic to safety and even waste disposal. They can analyze tons of data from all sorts of places like sensors and social media. With all that information, they can help city planners make brilliant decisions that make our lives better. Okay, so you stroll down the street and your eyes are instantly captivated by an extraordinary building. Its futuristic curves and features make it stand out from the rest. And it not only catches your eye, but also gives Mother Nature a high five. You might think it was designed by a genius architect, but little do you know it was actually a collaboration between humans and artificial intelligence. Imagine having a super smart design buddy who can whip up thousands of incredible building ideas in a blink of an eye. That's what AI-assisted design software does for architects. It can generate and assess a ton of design options. They take into account stuff like the best materials to use and the perfect placement for the building. Also, by analyzing data and crunching numbers, algorithms can help optimize the building's design. They can ensure it minimizes energy usage, conserves water, and manages waste like a pro. Every building strives to reduce costs, save energy, and promote a better world. The result? Architectural masterpieces that are both jaw-droppingly beautiful and super practical. The cityscape of the future will be dotted with these awe-inspiring structures. Oh, but that wasn't impressive enough for you? Well, how about a stunning, futuristic building that seems to defy gravity? It's not made of traditional bricks and mortar, oh no! This marvel was created using the powers of 3D printing. With the help of AI, architects designed every intricate detail and fed all the important data, like what materials to use and how the site conditions might affect the structure. AI algorithms work their magic to optimize the design, making it both breathtakingly beautiful and rock solid. 3D printing is basically like having a magical machine that can create awesome structures straight out of a sci-fi movie, and AI jumps in to make sure these structures are not just pretty, but also strong. In the city of the future, 3D printing will become the ultimate architect's tool. It will allow them to create structures that were once impossible to build. From mind-bending shapes to intricate details, the possibilities are endless. But AI isn't just making buildings look great, it also makes them efficient and cozy. Let's say you step into a futuristic office building, and voila! 
the lights automatically adjust to match your mood, and the temperature is set perfectly for you. These futuristic buildings are capable of sensing and responding to their surroundings, just like you do. They control the lighting, keeping it just right for the time of day. They manage the temperature, so it's always cozy and comfortable. They even keep a watchful eye on security and fix small issues before they become big headaches. So, the smart building knows when people come and go, so it optimizes energy usage accordingly, saving the planet and some cash along the way. Now the cool thing is, all these aren't the only possibilities. How about turning skyscrapers into a vertical forest? Recently, an architect from India got super excited about the power of artificial intelligence. So, he decided to team up with an image bot called Midjourney to create a vision for the future. But instead of a dull, robotic world, they aimed for something spectacular. With text prompts like utopian technology and futuristic towers, the architect and AI got to work. Guess what? Midjourney didn't disappoint. It conjured up a world where buildings were covered in lush vertical forests and adorned with shapes inspired by nature. They wanted to create a sustainable future that harmonized with the environment. The architect, Manas Bhatia, is super positive about AI's potential. He doesn't see it as a threat to his job, but as a powerful tool for positive change. He envisions a future where architects and AI collaborate to make breathtaking designs. In his project, Patia even asked the AI to imagine symbiotic and hollowed structures, and it responded with pictures of apartments nestled within hollowed out trees. Imagine a world where the building itself becomes a living, breathing part of nature. Well, Bhatia believes that nature should play a big role in architecture. He loves designing structures that embrace nature's beauty and functionality. From buildings built around trees to facades that regulate temperature, he's all about blending architecture with the natural world. With architects like Patia and the superpowers of AI, the future of cities is going to be amazing. So get ready to step into a world where nature and technology coexist in perfect harmony. It's a dream we can't wait to see come true. Or if you're not a big fan of trees, how about this? Skyscrapers that aren't made of solid bricks, but instead, they're inflatable wonders. Zumo, an architectural practice in Barcelona, used the magic of AI to bring these wobbly structures to life. These inflatable superstructures rise above future cities like illuminated balloons in the sky. Here's the best part. These inflatable buildings have sustainability superpowers. You can pump them up to towering heights, flatten them for easy transportation, and rebuild them wherever they're needed. Plus, they're powered by renewable energy, reducing their impact on the environment. Pretty cool, right? Phew, the future is zooming toward us like a rocket. Artificial intelligence can become the secret sauce that makes architects work extra special. But hey, with great power comes great responsibility. We need to use AI wisely and ethically. For now, we don't have to worry about machines replacing architects. Artificial intelligence still needs a human hand, or else we might end up with buildings that look like mashed up bananas or ice cream cones, unless that's your thing. In addition, humans have one important advantage. They, well, are humans. We need to keep in mind that artificial intelligence doesn't have emotional intelligence. It's a brainy genius, but it can't fully understand the feelings and vibes we humans crave in our spaces. So we must remember to infuse our designs with that human touch, those warm and fuzzy elements that make us go, ah, I feel right at home. And let's not forget that AI is still learning. It's basically just taking its first steps, and we need to be patient and give it time to grow. Rushing things too quickly could lead to wonky designs or buildings that look like a jumbled puzzle. This might look cool if you like avant-garde architecture, but for regular folk, no thanks. So, as the future unfolds at warp speed, let's embrace the wonders of AI and architecture. But let's also remember to balance its brilliance with our own human touch. Together, we can create a future where buildings are not just functional, but also filled with heart and soul. It's an adventure that's out of this world. The Earth has three main layers, two parts of the core, the dense, hot inner core, and the molten outer core. Then comes the mantle, and then follows the thin crust, the surface that supports life as we know it. At least, that's what we thought, because now scientists found a new mysterious layer located deep within the solid inner core. Earth's inner core is approximately two-thirds the size of the Moon and made of nickel and solid iron. It's burning hot. 
The temperature at the center of our planet is the same as at the surface of the sun. The outer core can reach almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's difficult to explore it because we can't go there. And it's like looking through a really dirty window of 3,200 miles of molten metal and rocks. But we can rely on laboratory experiments on heated pressurized rocks, signals from seismic waves, and computer models. When an earthquake hits, it sends out seismic shock waves. Those waves travel through layers at a different speed, depending on the direction they go and the material they move through. In the new study, a team of scientists set a data set of 100,000 deep earthquakes. Some of them went over 60 miles below the surface. When an earthquake happens on one side of our planet, scientists track its waves all along to the other side. Waves change when they come to the other side, so scientists try to understand the materials these waves have passed through. They found a new layer in the core of our planet thanks to earthquakes. Normally, shock waves travel along the equator, but down below, they digress and go into different directions, about 60 degrees to the side. When waves pass through the inner core going from north to south, they will travel more quickly than waves going through the core parallel to the equator. It's important to understand the core because it creates our magnetic field, which, in turn, protects the planet from things like solar winds that are charged particles coming from the sun. In the 1960s, we discovered the Earth pulsates every 26 seconds. It's like clockwork, a giant heartbeat. The ground is slightly shaking, but we mostly don't feel it. Researchers can still track it. Some of them think the continental shelf comes as a huge wave break under the oceans. For example, the highest part of the North American continent falls off into a deep abyssal plain. One theory says waves hit this spot, producing regular pulses. It's like having all kinds of drums. You hit them with your hands and accidentally slam that one spot that produces the right harmonic bang to rattle our entire planet. If this theory is true, we're lucky there are no more spots like this that can shake the Earth. Other scientists believe the pulsation happens because there's a volcano near the critical spot, the island of Sao Tome in the Bight of Bonny. You're walking, running, and jumping, but when you stop, it always feels like you're standing still. In reality, you're moving even when you're perfectly still because our planet is always on the move. Depending on where you're at, you could be spinning through the universe at more than 1,000 miles per hour. If you're on the equator, you'll move the fastest. Let's say you have a basketball spinning on your finger. Check the ball's equator. A random point on it has farther to go in just one spin than any point near your finger. That means the point on the equator is moving more quickly. The Earth is a planet that recycles all the time. The ground we're walking on is recycled. Our planet's rock cycle turns rocks of one type into another. That's a cycle that goes on and on. The depths of our planet are filled with magma. As magma is going out onto the surface, it hardens into rock. Tectonic processes like volcanic activity, earthquakes, mountain building, and all of the other processes that shape the surface of our planet bring that rock to the Earth's surface. When the rock is on the surface, erosion shapes it and shaves its bits off. Those small particles then get deposited. All the pressure coming from above compacts the particles into sedimentary rocks, like, for example, sandstone. Sedimentary rocks can also end up deeper and deeper under the Earth's surface. Since there's a lot of heat and pressure, they get cooked into metamorphic rocks. They can go back to the surface once again, or even end up being re-eroded. Sometimes the crust plates are pushing one under another, and this way, rocks can transform into magma once again. We've explored only 5% of the ocean so far. The ocean itself, as well as life below the seafloor, is still a mystery. The sediments that are underlying our oceans are home to different microorganisms that exist even at depths of 1.5 miles beneath the seafloor. There are microbes hidden deep inside volcanic rocks below the seafloor off of the parts of the Pacific, hidden under 870 feet of sediment. 
the biosphere under the seafloor is growing extremely slowly compared to life on the surface. Cell division happens every 10 to 1,000 years. Something's different about the Earth's axis. Climate changes and melting glaciers, mostly in the regions like the Himalayas and Alaska, made the axis shift. Our planet has two kinds of poles. Are the south and north magnetic poles? They affect, they affect things such as drift and navigation. The axis that the Earth is spinning around is another kind of pole. It shifted a little bit over time, but we don't know exactly why. Researchers realize there are moving masses of water, pushing the Earth's axis eastward. Take a basin of water as an example. If you're moving it back and forth, sloshing makes the water move its weight all around. A similar thing is happening on a planetary level. No matter how large an earthquake is, no human could ever feel an earthquake on the opposite side of the Earth, although some people claim they did. In 2013, there was one near the Kuril Islands with a magnitude of 8.5. It went around 400 miles deep. It was so strong, people in Australia reported they could feel the ground shaking. The strongest earthquake happened in Chile in 1960 with a magnitude of 9.5. The rupture zone stretched from 311 miles to almost 620 miles along the country's coast. Earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or higher can't happen. The magnitude depends on the length of the fault where it occurs. The longer the fault, the bigger the earthquake. A fault is a break in a part of the planet's crust. It has rocks on both sides, and they move past each other. We haven't found a fault long enough to generate earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or more. If it happened, it would extend around most of our planet. An earthquake with a magnitude of 12 would require a fault larger than our planet. One side of our planet is getting colder than the other. The Earth has a system that keeps it warm from the inside, a red-hot liquid interior deep below the surface. It spins and, at the same time, generates a magnetic field and gravity. That way, the Earth's core holds the atmosphere closer to the planet's surface. The Earth also absorbs heat from the Sun, mostly on the surface. The heat doesn't spread equally on all parts of the Earth. One side of the planet, the Pacific Hemisphere, is losing heat more quickly than another, the African Hemisphere. This happens because land traps more heat than the surface under the ocean. The seafloor is way thinner than the landmass. Also, the temperature caused by the heat coming from inside the Earth is getting lower because of huge amounts of cold water above it. Clouds are not just like some fluffy distant pieces of cotton. They weigh more than a million pounds and help regulate our planet's temperature. If you take all the water droplets in clouds and bring them to the surface, you could cover the planet with a liquid layer as thin as a human hair. It doesn't seem like a lot, but this water is crucially important for climate. We'd have warmer temperatures if it weren't for the clouds. Have you ever wondered how the world will go down in flames? Will it be due to zombies, extraterrestrial civilizations, or AI taking over? Nah. Turns out, it might actually be mosquitoes and scientists causing the chaos. It's funny how things created by nature aren't as threatening as the stuff that doesn't exist naturally. And you know what's on that list? Editing the DNA genome. Experiments with the genetic structure of living organisms can produce completely new species, and no one knows how nature will react to them. Let's look at an example of gene drive. So it all started with malaria mosquitoes. To somehow stop the growth of their population and prevent the spread of malaria, scientists created a gene that magically made mosquitoes only have male offspring. Several insects with this gene transmitted it to others during the mating season and thus spread infertility. Scientists were able to stop malaria and destroy almost the entire mosquito population. But imagine if something went wrong in the mosquito genome and their population began to increase exponentially. Malaria could spread across all continents and create huge problems for all of us. 
Now, let's move from the little mosquito problem to a planetary disaster that can be caused by the desire for knowledge, which is deeply embedded in our nature. British cosmologist Martin Rees once said that we lived in the first century when human beings could determine the planet's future. It seems that it's so easy not to destroy yourself, but our nature is quite complicated. In pursuit of solving the mysteries of the universe, we have built a giant machine that, according to some people, may destroy our planet. And this device is the Large Hadron Collider. The main task of this giant machine is to accelerate particles and make them collide with one another. Scientists expect that the collider will help better understand the structure of our universe. In simple words, this is a miniature simulator of the universe. Using it may also shed light on the mystery of dark matter. During operation, the machine compresses atoms and makes them crash into one another at great speed. Perhaps this is how our universe appeared. Some people fear that a small black hole may form because of this collision. A tiny particle with a huge weight will pull all objects inside itself. Its mass will grow, but its size won't change much. As a result, it will compress the entire Earth and turn it into a ball measuring a little more than 300 feet across. At the same time, our planet will still have the same weight. A powerful gravitational pull on such a small area of matter can form a black hole that might later swallow up our entire solar system. There are also theories that the Hadron Collider could open a portal to a parallel universe with creepy monsters that would enter our world. But of course, such theories have little to do with science. Scientists have already launched the collider several times, and as you can see, nothing terrible has happened. But there is a small nuance. With each launch, scientists increase the speed of particles. Who knows what will happen when they accelerate them too much? According to Martin Rees, the probability that Earth will become a black hole is very, very small. Particles with a much larger energy charge fly in space faster than in the Hadron Collider, and nothing catastrophic happens. Okay, now let's go back to our genomic games to see what else can happen if we continue experimenting with nature. The main problem might be an imbalance in ecosystems. In the 19th century, sailors accidentally brought mice to Gough Island in the South Atlantic Ocean. Rodents had no dangerous enemies there, so their population began to grow. Mice began to displace dozens of birds from their home. The rodents attacked the chicks and reduced the population of entire species. Trying to save the birds, scientists decided to get rid of the mice. But these little creatures still managed to survive. As a result, the balance of the whole ecosystem was disrupted. Using gene drive to get rid of one species can lead to uncontrolled population growth of another. Imagine that malaria mosquitoes controlled the population of some flies. And what would happen if these flies lost their main natural enemy? The population of these flies would start destroying other species, and it would begin a chain of destructive events. All this suggests that playing with things that don't exist in nature is very dangerous. We worry a lot about how artificial intelligence can take over the world and eliminate us. Still, at the same time, we don't pay attention to our actions. Genome editing can lead to positive consequences, such as the appearance of healthier people and destructive ones, like the creation of artificial bacteria that can cause serious health problems. In general, destroying other species is a trait inherent in humans. Because of our actions, many animals have disappeared from the face of the Earth. Moreover, we even destroy each other. Such aggressive behavior is our nature. And artificial intelligence doesn't have anthropomorphic properties. Its logic may be completely different from ours, and instead of destroying people, it might strive to save them. And we have something to save us from. Remember the giant asteroid that erased more than half of the living creatures on Earth? The fall of the space rock caused a massive blast wave, a tsunami, earthquakes, and dust clouds that covered the sun. Dinosaurs and other animals couldn't survive in such conditions. But what if something similar happens these days? Fortunately, we're better prepared than dinosaurs. Firstly, we have the technology to track giant meteorites and calculate their trajectory. And artificial intelligence can also help us with this. Secondly, we can destroy an asteroid before it reaches us. 
several powerful rockets will quickly deal with any space rock and turn it into cosmic dust. Moreover, we will know in advance about its approach. But suppose that a huge stone the size of dozens of Everests will fly towards us. In that case, humanity should hurry with Mars colonization. But don't worry. Observing the sky shows that large asteroids capable of causing severe damage to our planet are moving in a different direction. The most giant known asteroid that could collide with Earth might do so in 2088. The probability that it will fall on our planet is 1 in 50,000, so you shouldn't have to worry about threats from outer space. What lies in the bowels of our planet is much more dangerous. Millions of tons of magma and hot gases can burst to the surface through destructive volcanic eruptions. More than 70,000 years ago, a large-scale eruption threw a tremendous amount of ash into the air, which then floated in the atmosphere in the form of a giant gray cloud for a long time. As a result, Earth's surface cooled down by several degrees, which led to one of the most massive extinctions in the history of our planet. Some eruptions happen not only inside volcanoes. There's such a thing as flood basalt. A colossal magma bubble accumulates under a vast area and begins to seep through faults in different parts. Magma slowly goes out there for many years and destroys all living things around. And the worst thing about this situation is that we can't do anything about it. Humanity has learned to track meteorites in space, but we're still not good at predicting a volcano's behavior. Even if we find out that some giant rock will wake up in the next six months, there's nothing we can do about that. We won't be able to prevent an eruption. All we can do is evacuate people from dangerous territory. We have no protection against earthquakes, and even more so, we can't stop the emission of ash into the atmosphere. It's possible that artificial intelligence will help us with this in the future, but right now, we are powerless. As you can see, there are several options for the end of the world for humanity and they're all slightly different from those imposed by pop culture and the media. In the end, is it right to look for threats from space or artificial intelligence? So we're moving to 66 million years ago in the world where dinosaurs lived. What are we doing here? We're just watching these giant reptiles and waiting for one of the most massive disasters on our planet to strike. Right now, a giant asteroid bigger than Mount Everest is flying at a tremendous speed, exceeding the speed of sound 40 times in the direction of our planet from the depths of space. It passes through our atmosphere, heats up, and hits the coastal part of the island of Yucatan, which separates the Gulf of Mexico from the Caribbean Sea. The enormous release of energy destroys all living things in the area, on land and in the ocean. The air over the island is filled with smoke and ash. Yucatan Island has taken the brunt of the blow. The blast wave instantly turns the green territory into a giant, lifeless crater. The asteroid fell at the wrong time. By the moment of the catastrophe, Earth had already been undergoing devastating changes. Continents were separating from one another, and some volcanoes were waking up, pouring lava onto the ground. Dinosaurs had been almost on the edge of extinction, but the asteroid shaped their fate. Now, Yucatan looks like a giant funnel of melting rock. There are no more dinosaurs here. But what about those animals that were far from the crash site? The noise from the explosion was so loud that pterodactyls hanging out far from the crater flew up into the sky in fear. A Tyrannosaurus got distracted from its hunting and ran away as far as possible, along with Triceratops. But somewhere, even further, in mainland Mexico, ancient lizards continued to chew grass and run around fields. They did notice a bright flash, but didn't mind it. They didn't even hear the sound of the explosion, because the sound wave dissipated in the air. No blast wave, no earthquake, and no meteor shower. Dinosaurs continue with their lives. Unfortunately, not for long. Most dinosaurs would have survived if the meteorite had fallen in a field, ocean, or any other place. Perhaps today, you would see them in nature reserves, but the meteorite fell in the most unfavorable place. 
According to studies, the giant rock had a 1 in 10 chance to destroy dinosaurs, and it took this chance. It wasn't a soft landing. The stone didn't slip on the ground, but hit the rocky terrain like a giant hammer. The catastrophe wasn't limited to a blast wave and a crater. The asteroid fell into large stalks of flammable materials. Simply put, the space rock got into a giant vat of combustible substances. This provoked a drop of millions of tons of soot and ash into the air. The fire quickly spread throughout the island, emitting black smoke into the sky. Dinosaurs living hundreds of miles away from the site are getting nervous. Feelings of anxiety are growing. Their inner instinct of self-preservation signals that disaster is coming. The sky becomes gray and darkens. Black clouds cover the sun and reflect the light. However, these are not just regular clouds, but volcanic ash. The asteroid fell at the most destructive angle. It also hit the coastal part, so the destruction reached the seabed filled with sulfuric acid. And now it's all coming out. Toxic fumes get mixed with incandescent ash, soot, and metals the meteorite contained. A fiery hot cloud emits acidic smoke that is very harmful to health. And this cloud, driven by the winds, grows and stretches all over the continent. It's getting cold on the ground. Plants, grass, and trees are quickly withering. The green valley saturated with life becomes gray and lifeless, which leads to an imbalance in nature. Most dinosaurs can't get fresh grass and leaves. This problem also affects predatory reptiles since the number of herbivorous lizards significantly decreases. Animals start to freeze and starve. They move away to search for some food and find a warm place. But it's too late, because a poisonous firestorm is approaching them quickly. Dinosaurs try to hide in burrows and caves. Some lizards are looking at the sky, which is getting darker each second. A tiny sparkle slowly falls from a black, fiery cloud. This is a particle of hot ash. It drops to the ground, touches the dry leaves, and sets them on fire. Millions of such particles fall to the ground. The forest flares up like a match. The smoke from the burning trees rises and becomes part of the expanding ash cloud. The more the fire spreads, the larger the ash cloud becomes. Sulfuric acid vapors mix with molten metal particles and fall to the ground as poisonous droplets. Acid rain corrodes vegetation and poisons the soil. Flying lizards rise into the sky and enter the center of the firestorm. Dinosaurs on the ground are running from the forest towards the water, but it's impossible to escape from the apocalypse. The scale of the disaster is increasing exponentially. While acid rain and firestorms destroy one part of the continent, the coastal side faces another problem. The fall of the meteorite caused a giant tsunami. It hits the shore and floods large areas of land. After the massive explosion, the first wave forms. It could quickly destroy modern-day New York. A series of smaller waves, the size of a five-story building, sweep across the Atlantic Ocean and the North Pacific Ocean. Giant tsunamis are not so scary for deep-sea dinosaurs, but the poisonous cloud poses a danger to them. Particles of sulfur and ash cover the sky above the water surface and bring down poisonous rain. Seaweed and phytoplankton don't survive it. Thus, millions of fish face the threat of famine. This causes huge problems for the whole food chain in the ocean. Giant sea lizards can't survive either. The meteorite created a domino effect that put the entire continent under threat of extinction. A few weeks have passed. The ashes have settled and cooled down. The fires are over, and the air has become cleaner. The sun is finally peeking through the clouds. But the planet looks different now. Giant lizards don't exist on the planet anymore. Green forests have turned into gray fields. Fortunately, not for long. The seeds of plants and trees have survived the apocalypse and are now blooming with renewed vigor. Nature is filled with colors again. Little creatures similar to rats have been hiding in the ground and have also survived. 
and now they finally get out to continue spreading life. It wasn't firestorms, tsunamis, fires, and lack of sunlight that destroyed the dinosaurs. The primary damage to the world at that moment was the disruption of the food chain. All big herbivorous dinosaurs and giant toothy monsters lost their food sources. Small animals and some flying dinosaurs survived to further evolve into modern birds and mammals. Large animals the size of a rhinoceros appeared 15 million years after the disaster. Tens of millions of years passed since that moment, and then humanity appeared. Thanks to modern technology, we've discovered the reasons for the destruction of dinosaurs. We don't know every detail, but we have a common picture of those events. And the scariest thing is that if the same asteroid fell again into some explosive terrain, we wouldn't be able to do anything about it, and our remarkable technologies wouldn't help much. Yes, we might disperse ash clouds and extinguish some fires, but it would be insignificant. Floods, fires, and acid rain would make life in big cities unbearable. The only thing that would help us survive could be underground bunkers and other reliable shelters. But how to survive the famine that would come after the destruction of vegetation and crops? We are developing and improving technologies that can protect us from asteroids, like lasers or space rockets with explosives. But even if we destroy one big rock, it might tear into a million pieces. Some will burn up in the atmosphere, and some will fall on the planet in the form of a meteor shower. Anyway, we'll face huge natural disasters. Therefore, all we can do now is hope that no rock from space will come to us.